Hi, this is a video about cyclovoltaimetry and some of the concerns um, at ZP we have when people are over-reliant on cyclovoltaimetry when actually the real world application would be some sort of biosensor. So for example, um, most glucose sensors, most um, blood glucose meters on the, on the market use amperometry as their analysis technique. But what you find is that cyclovoltaimetry is used quite a bit to uh, actually characterize um, electrodes. And so there's a disconnect between the cyclovoltaimetry that's used to assess the electrodes and then the methodology for actually running the biosensor would be amperometry. And so in this talk, I wanna sort of talk about that cyclovoltaimetry is interesting for biosensor developers, but if your method of analysis would be something like amperometry, then you should be very careful about an over-reliance upon it. So let me go through the slides now and sort of start um, discussing this. So as I say that um, people who are doing um, biosensor development um, sometimes like to use cyclovoltaimetry in their um, characterization of materials or characterization of mediators, for example. And in cyclovoltaimetry, we obviously sweep the voltage and we measure um, the corresponding current. Now I want to contrast that with with a kind of model biosensor, um, and a model biosensor would be, um, for example, the glucose strip, where you have glucose reacting with an enzyme, which then reacts with maybe a mediator. And I just want to kind of say that there's a certain complexity in a um, a sensor like a glucose sensor, where you have substrate, an enzyme, a mediator, and electrodes. Whereas in, often in the sort of cyclovoltaimetry analysis of materials, um, you often just have a mediator and the electrode itself. So it's a much simpler system. So it's already a sort of leap of um, faith to kind of say, well, you know, I can characterize everything using cyclovoltaimetry and therefore I'll know what's going to happen in amperometry. Whereas the amperometry, um, there's a lot more kinetics, a lot more materials involved in the amperometric. Um, biosensor. But let me go on to sort of explain this a little bit more. So what's happening is, and we do this at Zimmer and Peacock as well, um, we'll take our electrode material and we'll expose it to a redox active molecule um, and we'll do the oxidation of that redox active molecule and then we'll do the reduction. So for example, we might have ferrocyanide that we oxidize at one peak or it peaks with at its oxidation peak, and then we might reduce it. So we're sort of characterizing how the mediator is really interacting with that electrode. And we might measure the um, peak height of the oxidation, and we might measure the um, peak height of the reduction. We'll also look at the difference between the two peak heights. Now, for a one electron oxidation reduction, people are expecting a um, peak separation of 59 um, millivolts. And that is interesting, but I do get concerned that there's almost an over-reliance on this. You know, if it's not 59 millivolts, then the, you know, the electrode's no good for my application. And the other thing they're looking for is um, a peak height ratio of one to one, that my oxidation peak is the same height as my reduction peak. Now, at Zero People, we're very focused on getting our um, collaborators to market. So the, re the questions that we also think are really important are, does the electrode work for my assay? Um, are the electrodes reproducible, i.e. can they sort of be manufactured in a re reproducible manner? And what will these electrodes cost at scale? So I sometimes, and we sometimes get concerned that, you know, a cycle of voltammetry can be... Um, can be made more important than whether there's actually commercial merit in the electrode materials. So let me give you some sort of real world examples now. Um, so I am going to put a link down below on this video because at ZP we do actually, we have, we have in the past actually done quite a lot of CV or cyclovoltaimetry on our different electrodes. This is probably the gold one, this is probably the carbon one. Um, and I will put a link down below on this. And this, for example, is our platinum one. Um, and I was looking at this platinum electrode, and actually our peak separation here is about um, 100 millivolts. 
So it wasn't the perfect 59 millivolts that we got earlier on. But yet we are able to use it in um, to uh, fabricate glucose sensors upon. So it's just a real world example of it's nice to see the CV, but even if I don't meet the, the golden criteria of 59 millivolt peak to peak separation, it doesn't mean it, um, it can't work in an amperometric um, sensing application. So I do feel like the real world example here does sort of say cyclovoltammetry is interesting, but you don't need a perfect cyclovoltammetry of peak separation of 59 millivolts or peak to peak height ratio of one in order for it then to go on to be a perfectly good um, biosensor. So when we do our cyclovoltammetry, as I explained earlier on, you know, we're oxidizing um, in this case, we might be oxidizing ferrocyanide to ferrocyanide on the oxidation wave. And then on the reduction, we're reducing um, ferrocyanide back to ferrocyanide. So on the first part of the sweep, when we come up, um, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. And then on the way back, we're reducing Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. It's really quite a simple system. And this is what I was saying at the very beginning. It's quite a simple system. You just got an electrode in contact with a redox active molecule. Now, when you, if I'm going to take the glucose sensor as the model biosensor, then when you look at a glucose sensor, you know, so let's, let's zoom in on that glucose sensor. We have the mediator here. I'm using ferry cyanide. And cyclovoltammetry, if you did a cyclovoltammetry experiment, it would tell you about how the ferry cyanide oxidized and reduced. So if you did get um, an oxidation and reduction wave, that's a good sign. You know, we're not, we're not, you know, so it's good as a screening experiment because you'd like to see that this material could be oxidized and reduced. And also the cyclovoltammetry gives you, does give you a uh, useful piece of information. It tells you what kind of voltage um, do you get the peak potential for ferry cyanide? And what we would do with that, we, we would say that any voltage beyond so if watch the direction of my mouse any voltage over here then would mean that you were in the um, mass transport region when you're making a glucose sensor um, cyclovoltammetry is a good way of showing you what voltage to use because any voltage beyond here is a useful indicator that's that's where you want your glucose sensor to be um, operating at for example so it is interesting to have the cyclovoltammetry you would like to know that you're redox molecule could be oxidized and reduced. But one thing is, when you do amperometry, um, you're not, in, the, in, my, in the example I'm giving you, actually doing electrochemical reduction. You're only doing electrochemical oxidation. So it almost doesn't matter that I get an electrochemical reduction wave in my cyclovoltammetry, because that's not what's happening in my assay anyway. The reduction of my mediator in my assay is done by the action of the enzyme in this example. So it almost does, you know, it's interesting to me and it, and it gives me some certainties, but I didn't need this wave in order to be able to push forward with this particular mediator. And of course, it completely ignores the fact that there's a whole piece of biochemistry involved in this. So cyclovoltammetry is a interesting, but it's a, just, a, just part of the information when assessing materials for um, biosensor applications. You know, and I sort of play, play it back here that, you know, you've in fact got, you know, a substrate that reacts with your enzyme, um, electrons are delivered to the mediator, and um, it's then the reduced mediator that we then oxidize. So you can see that, in fact, I didn't need this electrochemical reduction wave in order to know whether this mediator was going to work, because the mediator is, in fact, not electrochemically reduced. Um, it's actually only electrochemically oxidized. And the other thing to say about a real, you know, once, you've, once, you, once you're on a biosensor development, in fact, you, know, you, put so much, you often put so much mediator in there that it's not a limiting factor. So um, there's often quite a lot of mediator in there. You don't want that to be the, right, the rate limiting step. And also you're applying the kind of voltage here that means the kinetics of um, this is the reoxidation of this mediator. They're so f the electron transfer kinetics are so fast that the cyclovoltammetry is kind of interesting, but it's not it's not dictating this because we're applying so much voltage here anyway.
I am going to now sort of, I don't like to always dabble into the theory on these things, but let's try to put some maths here. So when you look at cyclovoltammetry, you have an electron transfer region. And um, it's worth saying that, um, you know, I, I've, I've kind of derived this equation from um, Bard and Faulkner. I mean, I think the equation comes from, if you want to know about this, it's there's a butler volmer equation, which becomes a Tafel equation. And then in their book, Bard and Faulkner, they did a version of it. And then I've just made another sort of version of the equation. But in the first region of cyclovoltammetry, you have um, an equation and it has two terms in it. It has K, um, which is the electron um, transfer constant or transfer rate, and then a voltage term. And what they do is they tell you um, how good your, how good your um, rate of electron transfer is. And it tells you what, what kind of voltage you need in order to drive that electron transfer. So the first, first part of cyclovoltammetry is telling you about the kinetics of the electron transfer. And that's kind of interesting. But by the time you're doing a biosensor, you're not working in this region. So as interesting as it is, you're actually working in this region over here. So let's go on to sort of start talking about that region over here. So I said earlier on that cyclovoltammetry is interesting because it does tell you what kind of potential to apply at your electrodes but when you for example are doing a or fabricating a glucose sensor developing a glucose sensor you're often working in the mass transfer diffusion limited region which is out here and you're often working at voltages that are just slightly more positive than the peak potential so in fact this equation where the electron transfer is all interesting and the um this voltage is kind of interesting. You're not working in that region. Um, in fact, the peak of this is has a slightly different equation. Um, and when you look at that equation, voltage is not in here at all, and an electron transfer is not in here at all. Um, in fact, what's, what's now appearing is diffusion, because this is now under diffusion or mass transport control. So in this region, you are under electron transfer control. So cyclovoltammetry tells you a lot about electron transfer control. But then you move into what's called the mass transfer region, and all the um, constants and the voltages all disappear. And you're just left with, basically, with diffusion, which tells you about mass transport. So there's kind of like this um, very deep interest in cyclovoltammetry. But in reality, when you then transfer over to amperometry, you're in the mass transport limited region and so all the kinetics that were kind of interesting um, in, from cyclovoltammetry are not there. Now in a very simple case in amperometry, in fact the equation that you can use is the Cottrell equation. And when you look at the Cottrell equation, the Cottrell equation assumes that you're, for example, in an oxidation you're working more positive than this peak potential. So there's no voltage term in here and there's also um, no electron transfer term either. That's just assumed to be going as you know very, very fast. And it's actually diffusion that's controlling everything. So cyclovoltammetry has a shape and an appearance that's driven by um, the electron transfer constant um, and also the voltage um, term here. But then when you look at um, the, equa the Cottrell equation, which is a simple version for telling you what a glucose sensor is doing, those terms are not in there. So you've got to be very careful about overinterpreting this. It's, it's for information only, but much of its shape and et cetera is not actually, um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't it then influence the, or strongly influence the amperometry later on. I mean, what's really driving the signal in a biosensor and for, in this particular case, in a glucose sensor, what really is driving the signal? So we have glucose, um, being converted to glucolactone by an enzyme, and then the electrons are transferred to the electrode through a mediator. Now, when you build a real glucose sensor, you'll put the mediator in high concentration. So this guy is not a limiting factor, and you will apply a voltage that was more positive. In my, in my um, example, I put 375 millivolts as the peak potential. So you're applying a potential that's greater than 375 millivolts.
and you're working at high concentration. So those two things are not limiting. Now, um, you can simplify enzyme kinetics down to something called the Michaelis-Menten equation. And the Michaelis-Menten equation says the rate of reaction is proportional to some um, kinetic terms. So that's the, um, the catalyst rate constant for the enzyme. That's the enzyme concentration. And that's a, um, a catalyst term as well, uh, or an enzyme term. So you've got three terms linked to the enzyme and then two terms linked to the glucose. So this signal here is actually governed by this term here. So it's governed by this current is directly proportional to the rate of enzyme reaction. And the rate of enzyme reaction can actually be simplified down to rate is proportional to the enzymes or the enzyme and the glucose concentration, because that's what you want. You want all of this to be a constant and you just want rate proportional to glucose. When you look at that equation, what where is you know all the terms that we were kind of interested in um, when we were looking at cyclovoltammetry, there were terms like um, electron transfer rate. But that really doesn't feature here. There's no electron transfer rate because you're actually um, working at a, a voltage where the electron transfer rate is just going as fast as it possibly can. So in fact, you know, some of the things that you were concerned about from cyclovoltammetry and also the voltage, um, you know, we're working, as long as we're working beyond the peak potential, then um, the electrode is... Um, it, it, it's fine when we're not under um, any kind of thermodynamical kinetic con control from the electrons. It's all about the enzyme. So I want to say that cyclovoltammetry is interesting and it will give you an indication of you can, um, as long as your biochemistry, for example, is reducing your um, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, then cyclovoltammetry will tell you you can re reoxidize it to Fe3 plus. But the really the uh, the thing that's controlling your current in your chrono amperometry, as long as you've got the, the mediator in excess and you've got an over voltage, what's driving this current is actually the kinetics of the enzyme. And cyclovoltammetry, when is a screening experiment, is often used to characterize the electrode or characterize the electrode in combination with the mediator. Um, and at that point, you know, an electrode material can be rejected, but in fact, it ignores the fact that, um, you know, the entire current of a biosensor, for example, a glucose biosensor, can actually be driven by much more complex kinetics. Um, and in fact, when you, know, when, you, when you peel back and look at those kinetics, um, as long as you've got some conditions met, you know, some of the cyclovoltammetry terms that seem very important are not of, at all in the equation. So in conclusion, I think cyclovoltammetry is interesting. Um, we do record it at Zimmer and Peacock, um, but we don't get obsessed about the peak separation. If the peak separation is not um, 59 millivolts, and then we don't get over obsessed about it. It's, if it's ridiculous, the far apart, then it tells us that this, there's something wrong with the electrode. But you know, if it's 100 or 150, we're still not that concerned. And, you know, cyclovoltammetry, to really assess whether a material is good enough for your biosensor application, you literally have to put the, you have to build the biosensor material on top of it and try it. It's too, it's um, too much of an assumption to say that cyclovoltammetry is enough to, it's a useful screening experiment for whether a material or mediator can be used in a, um, a biosensor application, but probably the, the real test is you actually have to give it a quick go. So in summary, um, we do use cyclovoltammetry at Zimmer and Peacock, um, but I think it's got to be very careful about an over-reliance um, upon it, especially if your technique, for example, you're making a glucose strip and your technique is something like chronoamperometry. Um, there, use the CV to use the cyclovoltammetry to screen, but if you really want to decide if you're going to adopt or reject the material for your um, sensor application. I think you really need to try out the assay itself on top of the sensor. Okay, I'll put some links down below and I hope that's interesting. Thanks very much.